we're excited about this week. We're going to be talking about the alpha role. You know, I can't believe that's back. I thought that went out about the time that the rotary dial phone went out. I think it did. But you know what goes around comes around. Yeah. And I guess what rolls around rolls around again. I guess so. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. But anyway, the alpha roll, uh, meaning it's a training technique, if you're not familiar with it, in which you are supposed to manually roll your dog onto its back, pinning it to the ground until it says uncle. And when, <clears throat> excuse me. And when you do that, see, I get all choked up about it. <laughs> it affects me that much. It really does. <laughs> it's just really that bad. Um, but when you pin it and it says uncle, then you have accomplished the, I guess, the holy grail of dominance. You, oh, by golly, just showed your dog who is boss. I pinned you to the ground. Uh, I don't know when exactly this came about. I don't know why it's coming about again, but it is. Uh, not a week goes by that we don't hear uh, about an alpha role being done and, and most, you know, 99% of the time unsuccessfully, we get asked all the time, Brian, do you do the alpha role? What do you think of the alpha role? I tried to alpha roll my dog the other day and it bit me. Uh, imagine that. It, I don't know why. Do you know why Joshua? I don't. I, I have witnessed a theme though. It does seem as though that a lot of people who do take that alpha role approach do have some level of insecurities. <laughs> I mean, they, they want to take that big, bad dominant role with their dog and they, they know they can overpower the dog. So that kind of makes them feel good, I guess. I don't know. I, it does seem to be a theme of, of people who I, I see do that kind of thing, but yeah, well, say it like you really mean it, buddy. I, oh, I, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. <laughs> that's what we do. We say it like we mean it. We don't hold punches. And we have, we have wee thin little filters, but really that's about it, but let's get down to it. Should you alpha roll your dog or should you not? Uh, right off the bat, I'm just going to say no, absolutely no. Don't even think about doing it. But here's why. First of all, let's go down the list. Dominance, if that's what you're trying to achieve, you may at that moment achieve it for that moment. But then what's going to happen is your dog's going to go, okay, you got me on that one. But then it's going to hop right up and then it's going to say, if you come over, come over here by my food while I'm eating, I'm going to bite you in the ass. And that's what's going to happen there. It's not, dominance is found within a context and people really need to understand that. It's not an individual trait, but a reflection of an asymmetrical and dynamic relationship between two individuals that can vary over time and within the context. So taking that on face value, for example, you may be a very dominating person. You just may have that as your personality. I dominate. That's what I do. However, the issue is, is that you may have a boss. So again, at home, maybe you're dominant. Maybe you dominate your dogs. Maybe you dominate your friends and family. But if you work for someone, then you have to submit. And all social groups are reinforced by both submission and dominance from dominance from the top down submission from the bottom up. So therefore we a should never try to achieve dominance over anyone or anything, including your dog, unless you need it right then, unless you have to have it right at that very moment. So you should just not do it. It's, um, on a, from another perspective, if you try to dominate someone or something for so for a long period of time, then you are doing it outside of immediate needs. And when that occurs, just from a stress standpoint, the, the creature that's being dominated by you, from a natural standpoint, dogs don't understand that. No wolf dominates the entire, the entire pack all day, every day. They don't do it. There has to be some sort of compromising at some level. After all, I'm with you. I'm in this group because I have discerned that there's some benefit that can be obtained by being with you that will improve my own personal fitness. So in other words, I won't kill you and I won't dominate you all day long because I actually need you so that I can survive. 
So there's just no need for it. If you do it, it's going to become harmful. You're going to cause your dog to mobilize its stress response hundreds of times per day, which can then physically harm the animal over a long period of time. It, no, don't do it. Dominance is found within a context and you should only dominate if the outcome requires domination to get it done. Meaning I say, come, you're in the road. Uh, yes, I will use whatever it takes to get you to go from point A, which is in a very dangerous situation to point B right here in front of me, right here in front. So it's always found within a context. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people use the alpha role at, you know, dog parks or whatever to discipline their dog for playing too rough or something like that. And it literally lasts for as long as the dog is on its back. And then the moment that they let the dog up, the dog is right back to playing it just as rough as it was before. And there's a lot of issues that fall into that situation as far as their timing. They don't, they're not disciplining the dog within the proper amount of time. And also the dog's not associating the fact that it's on its back with, oh, I was playing too rough 45 seconds ago. Yeah. Maybe it thinks you just want to give it a belly rub. Yeah. yeah. That's and what and, Poe would think. And, and we're going to get to that because that leads me to the next thing I want to talk about the alpha role. Lying on your back, whether you be a human or whether you be a dog, is a defensive move. It's defensive in nature. Think of it. You're a human. You're being attacked. Someone is running after you, chasing you. They grab you. You fall face down to the ground. Is that a good survivable position to be in if your attacker, your assailant is on your back? No. no. You immediately roll, do everything that you can to get on your back so that you can use your teeth, your knees, your feet, your claws, your hands, everything at your disposal that you can use to defend yourself against an assailant. So dogs never roll dogs. Wolves never roll wolves. The wolf that is on its back did so voluntarily uh, or in play. And even in play, I, I can go way down that road, not going to today, but all play for a dog is practice. It is practice, practicing for some future event, hunting or social order, controlling groups, so on and so forth. But even still, I roll on my back. I do it voluntarily to defend myself. Even if I'm pinned to the ground and I say, uncle, well, as long as after I say, uncle, whatever it is that's got me pinned backs off, then all is well. But you should you continue to try and kill me? Oh, there's no uncle. I'm going to fight back. And I'm going to fight back with everything that I have. Now, for those of you who are live, we're going to just roll a really short video here. And in the video, it shows an 18-month-old wolf. Uh, so she's approaching her adulthood, and she's approaching her mother, who's a full-blown adult, and one of the leaders of the pack. And as the girl approaches, we'll go ahead and roll it there, Joshua. She approaches, the mother gives her plenty of warnings. Hey, I've got something in the snow that I don't want you to have. So that's called competitive aggression. And the daughter obeys like most teenagers do at first, but then all of a sudden decides she wants to push the issue. But here's what I want you to see. So if you're live and those of you just listening on the radio, what's now happened is that after mother said, look, back off. I mean it. Don't come over here. She gave plenty of warnings. She stared. Her ears were erect. Her tail was straight up. She was standing taunt. These are neon signs in the fog saying, if, if you come over here, you're going to be corrected you will be punished. There's no gray area here other than that darn fur. But the daughter comes over anyway and pushes because that's what young adult wolves do. And that's what teenage humans do. It is natural for us to push our parents. That is a testing proving ground. How am I today? Who are you today? What can I do today versus you? It is all com competition at the end of the day. So the daughter proceeds on anyway. But then when mother goes, that's it. Now you're going to get it. I'm done with the growling. I'm done with the stare. I'm done with everything. Now you're going to get it. Notice, if you're able to watch this, that the daughter is already on the ground, meaning her mother never touched her at, up to this point. Never. The daughter immediately dove to the snow and rolled on her back, 
on her own. So her mother did not roll her. And now the mother proceeds to grab her about the throat. Hey, we've talked about it before. The throat is the strongest part on a dog's anatomy. And the mother, having invested half of her genes into this daughter, does not wish to kill her. She simply wants to make a point. So she grabs her about the neck. But there's another reason why she grabs her about the neck. She wants to disarm her daughter. So this would now be like you uh, sitting on someone's chest while they're on their back and you're pinning their arms to the ground. By her grabbing her daughter by the throat, just in case, young lady, seeing how you pushed me into this, so maybe you're feeling it today. Maybe you got your A game going here. You've been working out a little bit, I can tell, looking kind of spelt there, got a good night's sleep. Maybe you ate an extra rabbit or two. Maybe you're feeling today is the day that I can take, oh, dear old mama. So mama, just to keep herself safe, disarms her daughter. She pins her by the neck and takes away her main weapon, which is her teeth. But however, if mother pursues and keeps pushing this and the daughter becomes too frightened, then you can guarantee that those legs of her will start to come alive. A wolf can rip the entrails out of another wolf on top of it just with their claws. They don't have nail trimmers. They don't go to groomers and get that thing cut back. Oh, no. Those are used to grab and to grab both terrain to propel themselves forward and to other grab other animals. So again, the point I'm making here is that it's not natural. Wolves don't roll wolves. Dogs don't roll dogs. So why the heck should you be rolling your dog? What do you think you're accomplishing here? What can happen and happen very quickly is that like I just gave the example with the daughter wolf, this can morph in an instant to what I call self defense aggression. And Kara, tell me, is that the most violent aggression on the planet Earth? Absolutely. You don't want to find yourself in that position. Of course not. I don't care how weak you are as a human. When it comes down to that moment in life where either A, you're given a choice, fight back and fight back with every atom in your body or you will not survive. That is a creature you don't want to be dealing with. You don't. They're going to give you everything that they have. So again, for those two reasons, A, dominance is found within a context, B, pushing an animal onto its back is not natural, therefore you have no business doing it, and even if they did do it, you're not a dog. You're not a dog. You're not grabbing with your mouth, you're grabbing with your hands. Well, if you are grabbing with your mouth, stop that. Uh, that that's just disturbing. Not only is it unsafe, it's disturbing. Uh, so humans are dogs, and that creates a lot of confusion for your dog. What's going on here? I mean, after all, many dogs will come up to you and on their own, like this little wolf did in the video that we showed, they will roll on their back. Maybe because they misinterpreted something from you. Maybe they think you have uh, hostile intentions. Who knows? But we see them roll on their back and we think, oh, the infant that we hold in our arms on its back. And then all of a sudden the oxytocin is flowing through our brain. Our neuropeptides have been stimulated in that attachment and bonding. And next thing you know, you find your head, you find your hand rubbing their belly. And the dog's going, uh, uh, oh, 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 hey, 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 hey. I kind of like that. Hey, excuse me, I'll give you two hours to stop that. And it becomes a habit. And all of a sudden, I learned something. When you get near these furless bipeds, if you just throw yourself on your back, they'll actually make you feel good. And here it goes. Now you're down the rabbit hole, baby, because, oh, I know why you're laughing, Kara. I know exactly. Here, you look over here at her. If you go on the video, you look over here to my right. I know. I created it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, her butt can't even land on a sofa that there's not already one of our Morkies in her lap rolled over on its back. <laughs> and of course, the looks that this little pup gives, oh my gosh, those eyes half closed. And you're thinking, you know, I don't know if I've ever felt anything that good. <laughs> so no wonder they keep it up. So now imagine this, you rub your dog's belly. Now imagine this care for years, you have rubbed this dog's belly. There's not even hair on there anymore. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you decide, oh, I read something on the internet that you're supposed to flip the dog over on his back. And yeah, I'm kind of mad at her because she chewed up this or she went pooping out or whatever, whatever. 
and I'm mad at you, obviously. And you didn't come to me when I called you, and you jumped all over my friend when she came over. So you need some leadership here, little dog. And you decide to flip them on their back. She would be so confused. Oh, amen. And so many dogs are. They are confused. And just like the example Joshua gave at the dog park. Guys, it's horrible. It's horrible. These animals have no clue. Am I being attacked at this moment? Now, of course, they can rely upon some other signals over a period of time. So if you were someone that decided, I'm going to alpha roll a couple of times today, and then I'm going to alpha roll a couple of times tomorrow, and then the next day, and it's just going to be my morning routine, get up, have a cup of coffee, roll my dog, you know, and then go to work, come home, kiss the wife and roll my dog. If you get into that, that starts becoming a routine. Then, of course, then at that point there, the animal would pick it up and be a lot better with it. And It'd just, already be on its back, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just say, get it over with, buddy. Get it over. I hope we had a better day than you had yesterday. Just, just get her done. You know, I'm tired of dealing with it. Uh, but outside of that, guys, no. For all those reasons we said, and just to go over one last time, Dominance is found within a context. No one should ever be a full-time alpha over anyone. That is not nature. It's never been replicated like that in nature. Why we think we have to do that. Uh, as Joshua brought up, I think there's a few issues with that. Maybe you just have the need and maybe you need to go visit with someone yourself. But no, you don't need to constantly dominate people. You need to compromise with them. Uh, lying on the back is a defensive mode. Dogs are going to do it by themselves. So therefore, this can morph quickly into self-defense aggression. Uh, it can cause confusion. Oh my gosh, I don't know what's happening. Belly rub or punch me in the belly. I don't know. No, no, and no. Do I need to say no one more time? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, no. Don't do it again. I the, the, A lot of people don't think that they can... They can challenge their dog or they can't let their dog challenge them. And I, and I really want that to be clear with this. The whole alpha thing constantly is not a good thing. You do not want to be overpowering with your dog all the time because then you create a dog who is walking on eggshells. They can't feel like they can play tug with you. They can't take a ball out of your hand. They can't take treats out of your hand sometimes. You know, they, they there's a lot of issues when you play alpha all the time. And I would say Hollywood and and a lot of different TV shows and things like that have portrayed that that full time alpha position, and that's just that's not beneficial to you or your dog. Well, you know, they also didn't watch the whole thing. You know, we are so good as humans about pulling just pieces out instead of taking everything and it's in all the view, every part of that this totality we don't we are reactionary creatures so next thing you know we look over and some dog's got another dog pinned on his back and someone at some point went oh oh that's what i need to do and they're probably the same people that growl at their dog and prance around on all fours because they're supposed to do that and they're supposed to eat out their dog's bowl because that'll show them by golly i own the darn food around here uh it's silly if you had slowed the film frame by frame, you would see that no dog rolls another dog. The dog on the bottom rolled because it felt it needed to at that moment. And even in play, let me emphasize this one more time. All play is practice. There is no such thing as pure play among dogs or wolves. It doesn't serve a purpose. You know, only humans do things that we have a very difficult time understanding. What was the purpose of that? That goes against all the rules. But you know what? We're finding out. We're finding out genetic connections, all sorts of things that we'll know a whole lot more a decade from now. I guarantee you that. Well, I, th I think there's even an argument to be made that even in human play with children and, and even into adulthood, that they're doing that for a purpose as well, to test their own limits, to kind of see how they fit in a social group. I mean, anything and everything, all games are played through competition in some way, shape or form. Yeah. I wonder if we're going to start reading about parents alpha rolling their children. Oh my goodness. No, we are not. <laughs> well, again, okay. Now we well, won't go down there. I'll tell you what we are going to do guys. 
We're going to take a short break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about a wolf attack that happened to a family while they were camping up in Canada and explain a little bit how that occurred, why it occurred. And then we've got questions. So if you have any questions, send them in right now. If you're on uh, yeah, their Facebook or if you want to send an email, send it to Brian with a Y at Taming the Wild. Dot com, and we'll do our best to answer those questions on this episode. Okay, guys, we're going to take a short break. Uh, sit, stay, and we'll be back in just a little bit. Thank you. What were you trying to send me? No, are you talking about the text? Yeah. I accidentally, I accidentally sent it to you. I okay. Sent it to Kira, <laughs> We've been it. having to communicate. Oh, yeah. across me. Yes. Across the way here. Yeah. But so, it's all good. So the story that's coming up is the story of a guy who got alpha rolled in his tent by a, by a wolf. There you go. <laughs> yes. I think the wolf tried to alpha roll the whole family. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Maybe just the tent with them in it. <laughs> Yeah, if you guys are uh, anyone watching this, uh, if you're familiar with it out there, with the story here, chime in. Um, pretty straightforward story, but scary, a little bit funny, just even in one degree, just how it, it, it ends. Uh, the guy who was bitten by the wolf took this thing so well. Oh, my gosh. Because he had training. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, he, well, meaning, yeah, physically and emotionally, yeah. in every way, he took it very well. He knew what to do. He didn't panic. Uh, but in the aftermath, he's the first to joke around. He used to say, well, I guess I'm the flavor of the month or whatever. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the way to do it. You know, and your kids weren't hurt and, you know, things like this happen. Uh, I just hate when people just got to flip the world upside down. It just doesn't need to be flipped up. Just like bossing people around all the time. If I boss you around all the time. Am I the, uh, do I constantly alpha dominate you? Yeah, yeah, you do. But it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's all within Man. a context. <laughs> just did context yeah, is all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I have an alpha? It's just the same darn context all the time. Well, do I ever alpha roll you? Have I ever done that? I don't remember it if I had, but that, again, that could be my age, so I don't always count on that anymore. No, no. No? Not that I, not that I know. Have you alpha but, rolled me? No. Yeah. You haven't? I don't have to. I, I for, am the alpha. Okay, come back. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, we were talking about the alpha role, and while we we're on the break, uh, Joshua informed me that he believes that I've been dominating him the <laughs> his entire existence here. Then I had to ask him, I go, did, did I ever alpha roll you? Can you help me remember? Because at my age, sometimes I, like yesterday, I walked into the, our big training room and Joshua looked at me and goes, yes, may I help you? And I said, I need to walk back out of the room and see if I can recapture what I was going to ask you. And when I come back into the room, <laughs> it happens. You had, uh, you had an idea and then you came into the room, but you realized you had left the idea in the other room. You came back about five minutes later and goes, hey, uh, I remember. Can I ask you real quick before I forget again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, can you teach your ideas? Come. Come to me. Heal. Oh, stay with me. Dude. Awesome. <laughs> exactly. I taught mine how to stay. It stayed in the other room. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, so you, you, we can make a little bit of fun about alpha rolling, but on a serious note, again, don't do it. Hey, um, wolves are still out there. Believe it or not, they're there and they still live out in the wild. And when you go out into the wild, you can indeed encounter them. Now, most people can go out into the wild their entire lives and never, ever see a wolf. This guy and his family, well, him, not only did they see one, he was attacked by one. And basically, in short, a family of four, uh, a man, his wife, and his two sons went camping up into the Canadian wild. And it was in a national park. And it, just as they snuggled up in their tent, said goodnight, fell asleep, 10 minutes later, something hits the tent. And then it hits it again. And the wife wakes up and starts screaming. Now, that, that, that's bad enough. Imagine a husband laying next to his wife in a tent, and she's screaming. 
you know, especially during the first 10 minutes, you're probably in that REM state at that point there. Yeah. You're, you're, you know, your conscious is just gone. And so again, he wakes up. Oh my God, he's freaked. His wife is screaming in a dark tent. There are no street lights and something hits him and he thinks it's a bear. So he starts screaming because bears typically are afraid of humans. And he wanted this animal to know he was a human. So he starts screaming. Well, it didn't go away. It stayed right up against the tent. It's grabbing at the tent. It's biting the tent. So he slugs it. Now, this guy's a police officer. So he, he lets the creature have it, thinking it's a bear. Uh, but good news was it wasn't a bear. It was a wolf, and it promptly bit the hand that hit him. So again, don't bite the hand that feeds you, but you're clear to go ahead and hammer the hand that bites you. And the wolf did that. So again, he yells and he somehow or another gets his hand out of the wolf's mouth and the wolf tears the rain fly off the tent. And if you don't know what that is, a lot of times when you're camping in the summertime, it's hot outside. Uh, you'll have mesh tent to keep the mosquitoes away and you'll put a rain fly over the top of it in case it rains. Well, that got ripped right off. So now he could see his attacker and it was a wolf. It was only about four feet away and he screamed. Did it run the wolf off? No, the wolf attacks, <laughs> comes at him and again, grabs him by the hand again. And he's screaming. And fortunately, a fellow camper nearby hears this, comes out of his tent, rushes over and starts kicking the wolf. And between his kicking the wolf and the, the husband, uh, his name is Matt, uh, kicking back, they were able to get the wolf off of him. Then they threw stones at it and it ran off. You know, and when I read this, I'm thinking, I don't, again, I'm going to date myself here. And I'm thinking Jerry Clower. And I'm thinking about the story he tells about the guy who climbs up a tree to knock a raccoon out of the tree, but the raccoon ends up attacking him. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm going to wake up and some wolf's biting me and I'm going to go, oh, Lord, oh, good God, shoot this thing, <laughs> shoot this thing. And I can imagine a fellow camper going, I can't shoot it. I can't even see where you are. I can't shoot. If I shoot in there, I may hit you. And I'm going to go, oh, Lord, just shoot in here amongst us. One of us has got to have some relief. You know, so I can just imagine that that, that the first thing that came to mind with that Jerry Clower story is just so funny. Just shoot in here amongst us. You know, one of us has got to have relief. Uh, but he got the, the wolf off and Two days later, the park rangers were able to track this wolf down and they killed it. Uh, and they did DNA test and it came back positive that this was the wolf. Uh, he still had some of Matt in him and in his teeth. And they, oh this was the wolf that had attacked him. But the interesting thing is, and we didn't do this on purpose. This was a story I wanted to talk about before we decided we we're going to talk about the alpha role. But Matt says, and you can read this in the article. This article was uh, featured in well, many places, but one of my favorite places, it was an outside magazine. And you can read it. And he says, we learned in law enforcement that if you control the head of a dog, then you're controlling the dangerous area. There we go. Just, man, that dovetails beautifully. The alpha role and mama grabbing her daughter by the throat. Why? She wanted to control the dangerous area. And that's exactly what he did. While this animal had his hand, he grabbed the face and jaw of this wolf and held it there. In other words, he was saying, if that's what you're going to bite, then have at it. Because I don't want you letting go and biting me somewhere else. And he held on, and then he was rescued by that friend. Uh, you know, I in my book, Embracing the Wild and Your Dog, I tell the story of a time that my mentor and I came upon a she-wolf, an old wolf, and she was dying. She was lying in the snow, and her body was all broken up because out of desperation for food, she was no longer, she had been ousted by her pack. And guys, I know it doesn't sound nice, doesn't sound fair, but that's just the way nature works. If you can't contribute, then you're gone. And her offspring had grown to a point where they kicked mama to the curb. Don't know what happened to papa, but mama was definitely kicked to the curb. And a lot of these wolves will go off and they all end up dying because during the wintertime, you kind of need a little help there. And out of desperation, she tried to take on a full grown adult moose. And that's pretty much suicide. This wolf did the same thing. They found that this wolf was old. It has in, it was in very, very poor condition. And that's called desperation. I know there's meat inside those tents, 
and I'm going for it. And the wolf did. So, you know, you kind of feel sorry for the wolf. You really do. And unless you're mad, then you probably don't feel sorry for it. But again, he took it well. He took it right on the, well, right on the hand, but he handled this thing terrifically. And at the end he goes, I think I was just you know, flavor of the month. Uh, just a way to go, Matt. And no, had no um, hard feelings uh, for the wolf. Just sad like the rest of us that the wolf was killed. Uh, but it happens. So guys, if you go out into the wild, you may never see a wolf, but if you do, do me a favor. Don't approach them. Don't approach them. These aren't the wolves that you see at a zoo. These are animals, and sometimes they have offspring. And feeding the offspring is their priority. Humans have been attacked by wolves. They've been killed by wolves, and they will. Con this will continue to happen, especially the more and more we do go out into the wild and the more and more we encroach upon their land and their territories, they're going to feed on us. They used to do it years ago when we first settled this country. In fact, uh, there was a big almost mass extermination of wolves. They were hunted ruthlessly because three-year-olds were disappearing from mom and dad's pack, their little family. Children were being attacked. Sheep were being attacked. I mean, you're settling this country and all you own is one cow and two goats. And you wake up the next morning and the thing that provides you milk and the other things that, I don't know what the goats, goats did. You just raise them and didn't eat them, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, no they, they were gone. How much milk do you need? I guess. Okay, whole milk, whatever. So uh, <laughs> anyway, they decide upon themselves that, all right, take my cow, take my goat. But when you take my three-year-old, I'm drawing the line there. And they started hunting a bunch of wolves. So anyway, just a very interesting story there. If there's any lesson to be learned, um, hey, hey, take it like Matt did. You know, defend your family. Uh, I'm sure there's another reason he wanted to keep his family safe. Um, you know, in other words, bite me. Don't bite my family. And just try to avoid it if you can. But sometimes it's just going to happen. But yeah, this situation seems to be 100% unavoidable. This is just a freak thing that happened yeah and if the neighbor neighboring camper hadn't had chipped in you wonder what the outcome would have been right right uh, you really do wonder uh, unless you have a weapon of some sort all right i think it's time to abandon the wolf and like you said josh i wonder if the wolf tried to alpha roll him i don't know <laughs> but let's uh let's head into the land of questions because Kara, you we said we had some. some good questions this week we do yes all right let's do it okay my dog has been making great progress on healing while using food, but I'm trying to wean her off of the food, but she quickly loses focus. Any tips? Yep. Got a couple of them. Again, anytime we are working with an animal, we always keep in mind attention. What can I do to draw the animal's attention, getting the animal's attention? What can I do to motivate the animal? And does the animal have the cognition that is necessary to learn what I'm trying to teach it? So I'm going to kind of go to the attention part and the motivation at the same time. One of the first things I can tell you to do will be don't be so predictable. When you're predictable and you're headed down the sidewalk, you're always headed down the same sidewalk. Well, you both know where you're going. So therefore, do I really need you? No. So if you don't have a treat to give me, then I'm just going to check out the dog that I'm passing in the other yard and the dogs are coming toward me and the one that's down there playing with a Frisbee. And in other words, I'm going to look at everything but you. Uh, that's what, sorry, it's probably what I would do if I were a dog. But now imagine I'm connected to you and suddenly you turn right. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. Excuse me. What the heck was that all about? Didn't give, give a fellow a little warning here next time, but no exit stage, right? And you're gone. Uh, do that a couple of times. Just make a sudden turn, turn right, turn left, do a U-turn, do that. And now as far as that will definitely gain the dog's attention. Uh, if you're using a harness, it, you may get some results out of this. I'm not sure if you'll get all the results you're probably looking for. Therefore, I'd go to some sort of corrective collar, whether it be a compression collar or a prong collar. I would use that because then the input from you, the physical input, will not have to be as much. You can get away. You can achieve kind of like a medication. If you use certain combinations, you can achieve efficacy at a much lower dosage through combination. So therefore, making unpredictable turns, then using a corrective collar, and I promise you, this thing 
will be over within a few walks. I guarantee you. Now do keep your food with you um, and do what I call a variable reinforcement. Meaning every time the dog goes, Oh, Hey, what the heck was that? And turns around and chase runs back to you. Cause you did a U-turn and catches up and walks next to the heel position. You don't always need to give a reward right then. Uh, anyone who's been to Vegas, does that one arm bandit give you the money every time you pull on it? No, it doesn't. But look how many people go to Vegas and look what got built out of the middle of nowhere desert because of that very reason. A variable reinforcement is always the best reinforcement. And that means on occasion, and especially, especially if you get back to your proper heel position quickly and you can maintain it for a little bit, that's when I'm going to pour on that reward. And, you know, I'm always going to fade out food. I'm yeah. just one of these people that I don't want to always feel, okay, got to get my leash, got to get my collar, and oh gosh, I don't have any treats. Yeah. Now what happens? So me, that's probably the best advice I can give. And we always start heel training in a big open area, like a parking lot or a big training room or somewhere where we aren't going straight down the sidewalk. We can make lots of crazy turns. Yeah. The dog has to pay attention. We call it dancing with dogs. That's right. We're dancing. And that means you're going to step on a few toes every now and then, you're going to run into each other every now and then. But dogs weren't meant, or I guess the word I'm using, from, in, from an instinctive standpoint, it, it, it's not advantageous for a wolf to walk next to another wolf. For, for so many reasons, there's the spatial awareness that's required for moving in a single file line. It's all about safety. Most, most wolf packs are family units and mom and dad are looking after their offspring or the older offspring or looking after the younger offspring. And that is best done, best achieved in a straight line versus simply side by side. So you don't even have instinct to tap into. And that's why, you, good point, we always say get in an area where you're uninhibited where your direction doesn't matter. You can do the U-turn if you want to and not worry about running into the person who's walking behind you. You can make the sharp right turn and not worry about smacking into a car or a fence or anything of that sort. Get out in that open area. Joshua, that's probably what we do for about the first couple of days of dogs here for its board and train program is we're not going straight. We're going everything but straight. Yeah, and you can you can do this as an experiment just to kind of see what the or feel what the dog feels because we're asking for attention with their eyes. That's what we're looking for is watch me. So have like uh, somebody in your family take a leash. You close your eyes and just tell them to sporadically start moving around and see if you can keep up without having to open your eyes. Yeah. And and you have to watch them. But if they just walk down a straight line, you feel a little bit of tension on the leash, then you're able to follow them all day with your eyes closed. But the moment they start bolting around and moving around, you have to open your eyes to know where they're going or else you get knocked over. Yeah. If they can feel you, mm -hmm. then they know where you are. So why do I have to look at you in the world, mm -hmm. honestly? And I'm sorry, I, we, we may think a lot of ourselves as dog owners, but for most dogs, the rest of the world is far more interesting than looking at you. And again, from a natural standpoint, think about it. where did dogs come from? They come from predators. And if you turned your dog loose in the Alaskan wild in which that wolf bit Matt, guarantee you after a few days, it's going to start reverting back to a wolf, which means you need to be gazing ahead and on the sides, not looking to your right and looking at a furless biped walking next to you over your shoulder. You most prey is found by wolves through chance encounters, just a random encounter. Wow. There it is. And here I go. <laughs> and I'm after it. So know what nature does to your dog, know what they rely upon and just work it so that they can adapt to the needs that you're placing on it to walk next to me, not point. That'll get that thing done. There you go. Okay. Here we go. Our foster dog has no spatial awareness, which causes him to run into our handicapped lab and everything else. We're worried he will hurt our lab and himself. How do we solve this problem? Well, there we go. Speaking of spatial awareness, most dogs, if they've not had their eyes more forward, which some breeds have, but the vast majority still have stereoscopic vision, which means if you took your fingers and you ran them out to the, your furthest peripheral edge, they can see 20% further. So they have a wider field of vision, which is concerning that if you have that, why are you running into things? Why are you running? I assume it's running probably into walls, running into the other dog. Uh, maybe that's just how it 
plays. I it, it could be that. But one thing, no matter why, you can sit there and scratch your head all day long. Why, 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 why? No, me, if I fostered this dog, I am going to adopt this dog, I'm going to take it and have it checked out. Maybe we do have a vision problem. Well, and the first thing that I would ask is how old is this foster dog? Because we, I have a tendency to when somebody says foster dog or rescue dog, I immediately think older dog. But this very well could be a puppy. And puppies sometimes are clumsy and they run into things and they slide into things. And so addressing that from the the possibility that this might be a puppy, I always start what I what I personally call there may be an actual name for it. It's just environmental conditioning. And I always do this starting in my my house that the inside the house is a place in which we stay calm we're not running around and frolicking and playing so i have a designated place either outside or a designated room in my house that is allowed for play and so you can start conditioning the dog to certain aspects inside your house that this area is not meant for play out here is meant for play and you start to see your dog as it develops understand the moment that they walk into that room they just get calm yeah and on on that, watch dogs play in a house that people allow them to play. They'll knock things over. Yeah. You'll see chairs flying over. You'll see couches getting moved, coffee tables, you name it, which means it doesn't bother them. Mm -hmm. They can handle that. Uh, this is what would happen with wolf juveniles out in the wild. They're going to knock into a sapling. They're going to tumble down a hill. So me, a am always, when it comes to something like this, always rule out any sort of physical disabilities first, any sort of issue that's going on with the eyes, because there could be. So get that checked out. Then if you get the all clear signal from your veterinarian, okay, well now we need to get busy, roll up our sleeves and, and start establishing boundaries and rules. Do things like stay. Now I don't have to worry about the dog getting up and running into anything. You're gonna lay right here on your play spot or on your mat or just stay. That works great. Try healing your dog through your home. Put the leash on in the home. So many people don't do that. And yet that is really should be done. We well, have to do that with Takani. Yes. With our Siberian yeah. Husky puppy, he's, he's full of the bug out. And we've had to teach him from the time mm -hmm. he was a young pup that, hey, you know what? That outside environment, you know, the one out there got all that air and sounds to it and everything. Bug out. Inside here, this is kind of like a church. Come in here, scratch your initials on the pew, and that's where you remain. In other words, in my home, you you need to settle down in this environment. So actively train in your home. It's too bad that the lab doesn't do the, any training either. You know, you said that the lab would not react back to the young. The lab may be too old. Who knows? Could be. Yeah. yeah. I, amen. But a lot of times you bump into any dog. There's a, there's a certain quota you get. And when you exceed that quota, you, you are going school. to get, yeah, <laughs> you're going to be schooled by a dog. You're going to get cause and effect. And that effect's going to come real rapidly. So too bad that, that the lab can't chip in. But A, get the dog checked out. But make sure we got nothing going on with those eyes. Make sure there's not a neurological problem. There could also be that causing imbalance and wobble syndrome, all sorts of things. And if you get the all clear signal, let's get the training. Stays a wonderful or place. Both of those are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful behaviors for your dog to know, especially in, inside of a controlled environment. And then let's get the dog on a leash inside the house. Let's start saying, no, we don't do that. And this is what we do instead. Reward for good, correct for bad, game over. And yep. one last thing I would say is, is if it does actually just come down to you have an extremely unathletic dog that doesn't know how to use its body, then some level of agility training will also help teach the dog how to move its body in a more conscious way to kind of focus where this paw goes and where that paw goes. Cause if not, then, then I'm, I might fall. So it just gives that, it just helps the dog build that skill of knowing where their body is and what their body is doing. Yeah. Uh, good good yeah, advice. Good there. point. Yep. Okay. This next question, this would drive me totally crazy. <laughs> it says my dog excessively humps my leg. What causes this behavior and how do I eliminate it now? Oh my gosh. Uh, okay. This one really needs, if you, if you really want to pinpoint the cause, okay, let me just throw them all out there real quick. Cause we can get that done in 10 seconds. Uh, some of the is age determined. Uh, the other ones, uh, if the dog is neutered or spayed, humping isn't always sexual 
in this application. It's we have neutered dogs humping. We have spayed dogs humping. When dogs mount other dogs, they do rear mounting. They do perpendicular mounting. Perpendicular mounting is more indicative of dominance. Uh, I'm going to get up above you. There's a lot of reasons for humping. Sometimes I'm just excited. I'm so excited. My, my stress response is going through the roof and my arousal column is so high. I just don't even know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. So I just start humping. Um, and it happens. It really does. Excitement levels can get very high. Uh, there can be sexual aroundness as puberty. There are a lot of reasons for it, but you don't need to be concerned about that. Too many times we stall, we are frozen. We make no action whatsoever because we don't know why. Well, sometimes you don't need to know why. So here's what you can do about it. Me, you're humping me. Here's an easy solution. Walk away. Kind of hard to hump a moving target. Simply walk away. Say no and mean it. Push the dog off of you. You try to hump me. I'm going to say no and I'm going to push you off. But here's the problem. That, that here's why this thing kind of perpetuates itself. In most situations, before, before it becomes this level of frustration, it's funny. How many times have you heard people laugh? Go and check out my dog over there. Look what my dog's doing to, to her over there. Look what my dog's doing to my buddy over there. I mean, it's, we make fun of it. We, we do. And we don't really do anything to stop it. And one thing about dog behavior. If you don't want that behavior happening all the time for the dog's entire life, stop it the second it starts. So don't make fun of it. Get on it right then. No. Uh, again, if you had the dog on a leash in your house, actively training your home, off me, off. Snap that leash. Push that dog off. Make sure that animal understands quickly that you doing that to me is going to come with a cost. There's a benefit for not, meaning you walk up to me and you don't. Yes, you could get the random one arm bandit treat, variable reinforcement. But here's one thing I can guarantee you. You start humping me, whether I'm seated, whether I'm standing, whatever, I'm going to correct you. That's when dominance is found within a context. And that's a context in which I'm going to use it. And the best way to do it is take your two hands, if they're free, push the dog off, just like you would for dog jumping on you. Give an auditory signal. Make sure it's stereotyped. We use off. Off. You can say no first and then off, but off should be the main signal that the animal interprets and has a reference to. Off, push the dog off. How hard do you push? The dog will tell you. Start easy. Hey, off. Dog comes right back and starts doing it again. That's your, that's the biggest signal I can give you, the dog could ever give you and say, hey, I don't know what that was, but if it was meant to stop me from humping your leg, well, you need to dial that up a notch and say, well, thank you for informing me of that. And I'll be glad to oblige and start taking it up. You can use a remote collar too, right? Amen. That's really easy. You know, now you took away all the physical actions on your part. Uh, but again, make sure that you've already, if you're going to use the word off, then make sure you've already done off more than a few times with a leash or your hands. Mm -hmm. So now they understand what off means. And now they associate the signal from the remote caller with the word off. It's just that now the haptic signal isn't hands pushing me off or leash correcting me. It's now an electronic signal, but by golly, that will get it done. That for sure will get it done. And again, same thing, like all things, you know, wolves, when they correct wolves and dogs correct dogs, they start yeah, I don't care what breed it is. And I don't know how, how much they're prone to aggression. If you really slow the film down and watch it, they will always try something other than contact. Contact, I mean, not from a play standpoint, but from an aggressive standpoint, is risky. So they'll always try something else. In other words, they'll use just enough to immediately stop the undesired behavior and promote the desired behavior. We have to follow those same rules. So if I don't know your dog, your dog's pumping me. I'm just going to go, Hey, off. And if it works great, awesome. But if you jump on me again and start doing it, yeah, I want to hey, off. I want to get a little bit firmer about it, both my actions and my voice. And at some point you will hit pay dirt. And then here's something important to know. Once you hit that pay dirt, that's where it stays. 
meaning the next day or the next week, should this same action occur from your dog, don't start all over again. It trained you. It taught you, hey, if it's your personal level three that got the dog to get off of you, that's exactly where you start. Because I guarantee you, you'll only have to go up from there. You, you know, Starting all over again is not going to do anything for you. So that'd be my answer. Got it. Okay. I think this is probably the last one we'll have time for today, okay. but it's a good one. Our dog is terrified of being outside. I've tried everything to boost her confidence, but nothing has worked. And you know what's interesting is that we see this with Poe when her fur has grown too long and she has vision blocked and she doesn't want to go outside. She's afraid. Yeah. These are animals. Uh, gosh, that's why I tell people, if you have a breed that has hair in their eyes, pull it back. They learn with their eyes first. You know, and I get people all the time challenge me on that going, well, you know, I thought it was their nose was the strongest sense in their body. It could be. There's no doubt it is. But that doesn't mean that's what I use first. Meaning you're out in the wild and the wind is at your back, but the bear is at your front. It's your eyes that will save you from the bear. So therefore, if it's just your nose, you better always make sure in life, no matter where you go, no matter what you're doing, you're doing it upwind. And hey, welcome to canyons. Welcome to mounds. It doesn't work like that. That wind swirls all over the darn place. So eyes first. So get the. Your, that's why with Poe, once she can't see, her vision has been obstructed, then it's going to cause her fear to go outside because she can't see any possible danger lurking up on her. There's a lot of reasons why a dog could be afraid to go outside. You know of one, Joshua, you experienced that. Yeah. So, uh, I have a, I have a dog who suffers from, I think I've mentioned this on the show before. I have a, a dog who suffers from a generalized anxiety disorder and, um, she can hear a firework in July and then be affected all the way until August. So, you know, it's, she has absolutely no recovery time. It does take some level of intervention for her to get over something. So, um, last, since the last July that we just had, the 4th of July, a lot of fireworks and whatnot, she's now terrified to go out, um, into our backyard. If it's like completely silent, then she, she'll make her way out there. But if there's even so much as a lawnmower, like, two blocks down, forget about it. So, um, you know, you could take some counter conditioning, um, aspects into that, but if the dog's not taking treats, doesn't want to play with a ball, then you're kind of left with only one option. And, and to get her over that, her most recent experiences with the fireworks, I use the pre-Mac principle. And basically what that is, is it's, it's a, it's a version of positive reinforcement that is used not with the use of a reinforcement of some sort of desired stimulus, but the reinforcement of a desired behavior. So for instance, I would take her out into the backyard on a leash and her desired behavior at that time was to bolt back inside. So there was obviously some sort of benefit of getting back inside. So that's what I rewarded her with. I rewarded her with, okay, you can now go back outside. You've earned your right to go back inside. So I take her out a little bit further, ask her to kind of coax her back out to a little bit further closer to me, maybe with a little bit of a tension on the leash, a little pressure to come out. And the moment she made it slightly further than she had the time before, she was released to go back inside. And we did that over and over and over again. And what I noticed before we were done was the that she actually started making um, shorter trips halfway to the house and then she would come back and then eventually not all the way to the house at all. Yeah. So you're using the escape where what I wanted all along mm -hmm. as the reward. Yeah, that's a D you know, you're desensitizing the animal to right. be inside and counter conditioning. You would have to do a lot of that. Try to find something very enjoyable to do outside. Now in the beginning, Maybe the dog loves to play ball inside, but outside it may not, because if you're terrified, then you're thinking, uh, I could care less about the ball right now. If there's something going to attack me and, and hurt me, you have to keep the animal out there for a little bit and you have to slowly work this, you know, use food out there, you know, all sorts of things. Just make the outside a very positive experience. And this will take time. Be patient. Okay, guys, we're going to get ready to wrap up the show. Next week, we are going to talk about, does your dog really protect you? Does it really? Is that natural for your dog to protect you? And we're going to talk about a couple of articles I caught in this little magazine here called uh, The Dogs We Love. And we're going to talk about those articles because there's some really good stuff in there. 
but man, there's some really bad stuff in there. And of course, we're going to highlight on that during next week. So that'll be our main topic. And then we'll be answering questions as well. Yep. All right, guys. So we've enjoyed this week with you. Hope you got a little bit from it. Hope you stay safe. Don't be rolling anyone or anything. Um, and be safe out there. We'll see you guys next week. If you have any questions in the meantime, send them to us. Brian with the Y at TamingTheWild.com. See ya. Thank you. It says you went over. I always go over. You got a nasty gram from the engineer. Oh, they love me. <laughs> they love me. <laughs> yeah, right. See, he was listening on you, Kira. Yeah, they love me, man. I love them too. You know, we 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 gotta get thing going here. <laughs> about to say thank you. Bye. They're about to pull the plug. Yes, they were. It's over, Rover. All right. Well, everyone, thanks for watching live with us. Yeah. Hey, thank you, people. Uh, again, chime in here. We want your input. We want your questions. Send it along. Uh, and if you've got something important, these two don't mind sending an elbow over here at me and shutting me up for a little bit and saying, hey, I got a question from this listener or viewer. We'll answer that question. I'll do my best to get to it on the show. Perfect. Go cool. tune in next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. I We got a lot to talk about on that. Uh, oh, there's where, some, yeah. Yeah, where you stuff. think that your dog <laughs> naturally protects you all the time. My gosh, that I'll, is a huge misconception. Yeah, yeah I I'll, get it daily. I'll try to find that. Uh, that I, I watched a news um, report on this where this guy did this test on is your dog actually going to protect you? And he faked a robbery into people's homes. And... It like they went through all these different and all these big bully breeds actually tucked tail and ran to the back door or back room. <laughs> the only dog that actually intervened in an actual attack on her it was, was a like, oh, it was a little tiny little chihuahua mix Russell, of, some, chihuahua, of, yeah. of some sort latched onto that guy's bite sleeve or bite leg and just start. It's like, oh, wow, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's why they're called terror. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, you, when you're that little and you live in a giant world. You're going to have an attitude. Yeah. Oh, you, right. And you got some grit. It's well, simple when, as that. when also when you're, you're held and you're coddled and, and you get your way with everything because, you know, the smaller the dog, the smaller the issue. So you, you think you own this planet. Yeah. Not only they that, do. but when you get coddled by that thing and belly rubs and everything, you're thinking, take everything you want from this house, right. but that, <laughs> that's mine. Yeah. I'm keeping that. that, that belongs to me. And I swear I will fight you till I die, but you're not taking that. And, and on a serious note, dogs do possess humans. And we'll, again, I don't want to give away the whole show, no spoiler alerts or anything. We're going to talk about that next week. We'll have a lot of fun with it. You guys have a great one and we'll see you then. Take care. Okay.